Now, our speaker today, Natasha, is going to be speaking uh, to you about the case against Israel at the International Court of Justice. It follows a request from the United Nations General Assembly to the ICJ to give an advisory uh, opinion regarding alleged actions of Israel. And then matters perhaps have been overtaken uh, by uh, South Africa filing a case against Israel at the ICJ. Um, I've got no doubt there's going to be lots of questions, so uh, rather than putting them in the chat, please put them in the Q&A. Uh, a quick reminder that a question um, really is one or two sentences with a question mark on the end, uh, rather than an essay, please. Um, now, Natasha, in the days that followed the horrors of October the 7th, I, perhaps like you in the audience, uh, found myself in more and more and more WhatsApp groups. And in these groups, people started sharing videos of a brilliant, eloquent, fearless young barrister, an expert in international law, who was appearing on the news and in debates, often before very hostile audiences, and was really destroying false narratives against Israel, which would otherwise have gone unchallenged. And the messages that were appearing in these WhatsApp groups was, who is this? She's amazing. And uh, too often, um, why have they cut her off too soon? Well, I already knew that Natasha is amazing because I've had the privilege to work with her uh, for a number of years and seen the incredible work that she does as chair of the UK LFI Charitable Trust. She's a formidable advocate, with uh, speaks with tremendous knowledge and passion, and uh, we're very, very glad uh, that she's able to talk to everybody today. So, Natasha, thank you very much. We all look forward to hearing from you. Well, Daniel, I'm very grateful for that very kind introduction um, and uh, also for the opportunity to address uh, such an important and topical subject. And the two cases that you have uh, already outlined signify separate battles, uh, certainly in the war that is being waged against Israel in the international legal arena. They are both significant pieces of lawfare that target Israel. Um, I've addressed the phenomenon of lawfare in previous webinars and lectures. Uh, at its essence, lawfare is an abuse of legal processes uh, and legal institutions to advance political aims, in this case, to damage the Jewish state. And I'll address in respect of both of these cases how it is that these processes are being abused. But I highlight at the outset uh, that I do not see this as a problem only for Israel. The abuse of international legal institutions should worry every single champion of the rule of law and justice. It has a very damaging effect on the international legal order and the credibility of international law. And I believe that we have seen the impacts of the campaign of abuse against Israel in legal fora in delegitimizing international law and encouraging actors negative actors to engage in flagrant violations of international law, real violations, real war crimes and crimes against humanity, uh, and to do so with impunity. So that is why this is an important subject, not just for an organisation like UK Lawyers for Israel, but for all those who care about upholding the rule of law and the international legal order. Now, there is nothing new the campaign of lawfare against Israel has, of course, been gaining traction over decades now. In respect of um, the two cases at the International Court of Justice, in that uh, regard, they're, they're not surprising, unfortunately. They have been a long time coming. Uh, it is important that I stress that these cases are before the International Court of Justice, this is the judicial organ of the United Nations. This is entirely separate from the treaty-based International Criminal Court, established by the Rome Statute of 1998, to which neither Israel nor, for that matter, the United States are party. The ICC, International Criminal Court, has jurisdiction um, not over states, but over individuals and alleged crimes by individuals. And although the prosecutor of the ICC purports to be conducting an investigation into conduct by Israelis, it is the consistent position of Israel that the court has no jurisdiction uh, with respect to that investigation, uh, and that therefore such an investigation is, is entirely inappropriate 
and without legal basis. But subject to any questions that we may have from the audience, and, and those can be put into the Q&A facility, and I'm already seeing quite a number uh, that have already been put into the Q&A facility, but subject to any questions on the ICC in due course, I'm going to park the subject of the International Criminal Court and turn to the International Court of Justice, which is also situated in The Hague at the Peace Palace, but it is a different entity entirely. It chiefly deals with disputes between states. It has a twofold role um, to settle, uh, in accordance with international law, legal disputes which are submitted to it by states, and these are contentious cases. But it also has a role to give advisory opinions on legal questions that are referred to it by duly authorized United Nations organized, uh, or, um, United Nations uh, uh, organs, organizations, um, and specialized agencies. So the first case, just to give you a little bit of background to the International Court of Justice that entered the general list of the court, uh, the Corfu Channel case, was uh, submitted on the 22nd of May, 1947. And between the 22nd of May, 1947, uh, and the 13th of November, 2023, there were 191 cases that had been entered into the court's general list. So we aren't talking about a significant number of cases that the International Court of Justice uh, deals with. The two matters that I'm speaking about uh, at the ICJ are essentially one of each kind of case that it hears, a, a contentious case and an application by the General Assembly for an advisory opinion. Now, the first in time was the application for an advisory opinion by the General Assembly. And the first thing I think to know about this sort of uh, matter is that an advisory opinion is not legally binding. Uh, but just like the uh, so-called wall opinion of 2004, which was also an advisory opinion in relation to Israel, it will be treated by many people as authoritative. Uh, and in this respect, the International Court of Justice's track record uh, is deeply concerning when we consider that the wall opinion, um, in its role as a legal organ of the United Nations, the ICJ uh, ought to address itself to issues of international law free from political uh, interference. And nevertheless, in that 2004 opinion, uh, aside from um, the surface analysis that was adopted by the court with regard to the precise location of the security barrier that Israel had built, um, and it's, uh, I would say, seemingly superficial take uh, of the on-the-ground issues. Uh, the court's assessment of Israel's motivation for building the security barrier uh, was deeply problematic. There is not one mention uh, of the waves of terrorist attacks that had prompted the, the barrier project. Uh, attacks which, uh, I should note, the barrier was um, ultimately successful in uh, combating and in putting a stop to. Uh, those attacks are entirely absent from the court's considerations. And uh, that is, uh, unfortunately, the basis upon which the court uh, determined in that non-binding opinion that the barrier uh, was politically motivated rather than born out of a necessary security measure. Now, shortly after that 2004 wall opinion in the 2005 al fayh and Asher case in the Israeli Supreme Court sitting as the High Court of Justice, the uh, then president of the court, Aaron Barak, uh, engaged in a very illuminating analysis, a comparison, in fact, of the findings of the International Court of Justice against the determination uh, by the Israeli court in the earlier Beit Sorik case in which the High Court had in fact found that the aim of the barrier was to protect Israel's civilian population. Uh, and when it came to consider the placement of the barrier, it was able to determine a balance between the military uh, commander's authority to maintain security, uh, and on the other hand, the rights and interests of the local population. Um, now, this uh, conclusion 
that the uh, International Court of Justice reached, which was so very different in the ICJ advisory opinion, was in fact subject to uh, criticism by the judges sitting on the International Court of Justice at the time. Uh, dissenting judge, Judge uh, Bergenthal, noted that the International Court of Justice's opinion failed to address any facts or evidence specifically rebutting Israel's claim uh, of uh, military necessity or, or the requirements of national security. Um, and on this subject, the ICJ ignored Israel's position. Uh, it determined that it was simply not convinced that the route of the war was chosen for security reasons without showing why it was not so convinced. Uh, and therefore, according to Judge Bergenthal, the conclusions of the International Court of Justice were, were, were unconvincing. Um, also, Judge Wanda noted in his separate opinion that the ICJ uh, did not have before it, in that case, material which explained the Israeli side of the picture regarding the security uh, necessity uh, of the fence that had been built. Now, one may think, uh, on the basis of that 2004 opinion, that this might negatively impact uh, the court's uh, credibility, the authority with which its uh, non-binding legal opinions are viewed. Um, and that is pretty critical when one comes to consider the current application for an advisory opinion that has come before the court. Um, and it is one that has prompted UK Lawyers for Israel to, to make a submission. Um, in its submission, UKLFI has drawn attention to the fact that uh, the International Court of Justice's previous opinion regarding uh, Israel's West Bank security barrier was based on inaccurate and one-sided information, uh, which had in that case been provided by the UN Secretariat. Um, and of course, that, that it has uh, been subject to the analysis that I mentioned of Aaron Barak. Um, so what of the current advisory opinion that is before the court? Uh, well, this process was begun when on the 30th of December 2022, the United Nations General Assembly passed Resolution 77247, which was a request to the court for a legal opinion, which is entitled Legal Consequences Arising from the Policies and Practices of Israel in the Occupied Palestinian Territory, including East Jerusalem. In passing this resolution, I would suggest that the General Assembly made history. I have not seen any other request for an opinion from the court which presupposes all the answers to the real legal questions and simply asks what the legal consequences of Israel's supposed violations of international law should mean. So the resolution sought uh, an advisory opinion on loaded questions uh, which refer to ongoing violation by Israel of the right of the Palestinian people to self-determination, uh, prolonged occupation, settlement and annexation of the Palestinian territory, and measures aimed at altering the demographic composition, character and status of the holy city of Jerusalem and related discriminatory legislation and measures. And assuming all of that, it asks the court to take into uh, account these fallacious allegations, to take them as read, and to opine on what the consequences of that should be. Um, now, one example, perhaps, of, of the problems um, arising from this approach by the General Assembly is that the um, General Assembly refers in its questions to measures uh, by Israel aimed uh, allegedly at altering the demographic composition, character, and status of the holy city of Jerusalem, but it entirely ignores the fact that the Arab population of Jerusalem uh, has increased from 26% to 39% in the period uh, since 1967. Now, there are a number of states and international organizations that have made submissions to the ICJ in relation to this advisory opinion, some of which have been uh, published. Uh, and I've mentioned that UKLFI has made one sub such submission uh, a 40 page submission to the court, which was submitted jointly with uh, LNET, the European Leadership Network, an international organization. Um, and this was uh, provided in early October last year. Now, I've been informed that the content of the UKLFI submission is, is 
pretty significant in that it raises points that have not been addressed anywhere else. Importantly, it highlights the nature of the loaded questions which the court has been asked, but it also notes that the 29,000 pages of documents relating to Israel produced by the UN um, since 1967, which the United Nations uh, Secretary General uh, has provided to the court, uh, begin only in 1967. And one of the central planks of the UK LFI memorandum was to show how this documentation is, is highly unreliable and the product of the UN's longstanding anti-Israel bias. As a basic starting point, uh, the court is essentially therefore not in a position to give a judicial opinion in this case because the information is too unreliable. Um, if the court simply adopts the allegations defaming Israel, which are contained in the material that has been provided to it, these will unfortunately be taken to be incontestably true, to have been endorsed by the international court. Uh, that is plainly uh, and essentially the aim of these proceedings, uh, to give these modern blood libels the stamp of judicial approval, uh, and that will inevitably promote anti-Semitism around the world. Now, the, the nature of the material provided uh, is um, nothing new or uh, not particularly surprising. Since 2015, uh, the UN General Assembly has adopted 140 resolutions condemning Israel, uh, 64 resolutions condemning all other countries in the rest of the world combined. The UN Human Rights Council has adopted 104 resolutions condemning Israel, 97 condemning all other countries combined. And the Wealth, World Health Organization has adopted nine resolutions condemning Israel and absolutely none uh, condemning other countries. And it is not just the statistics that tell a story, but the content of those resolutions and crucially the reports upon which they are often based, which are so distorted and defamatory. Now, the UN's uh, discrimination against Israel has been recognised by its former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, um, as well as in a, a signed letter by 100 members of the US Senate, in including strong critics of Israel, uh, such as Bernie Sanders. And the material provided to the court by uh, the UN Secretariat, um, as I indicated, notably only begins in 1967. So in its submission, uh, another uh, key issue that UK LFI uh, sought to address was to mitigate this deficiency and to summarise the history of the land of Israel from ancient to modern times, um, addressing the rights of the Jewish people recognised by the League of Nations mandate for Palestine, um, continued, of course, by Article 80 of the UN Charter, as well as the application of the doctrine of uti postedetis juris to the formation of Israel's borders at independence. Um, that is a uh, perhaps overview of uh, what we know so far about the application um, for an advisory opinion and critically um, UKLFI's uh, submission, uh, which uh, has been uh, also summarised uh, on the UKLFI website. The hearings in this advisory opinion are, are due to take place in the early part of this year, uh, and more material undoubtedly uh, will come out in the course of, of those hearings. And that is uh, essentially as, as much as I propose to say on the advisory opinion. Before moving on to the most recent controversy, the latest instalment in uh, the Lawfare Initiative's in the international legal arena, which of course is South Africa's application to the International Court of Justice just before the new year, in which it has applied for uh, the court to order provisional measures, including that Israel shall immediately suspend its military operations in and against Gaza. So South Africa has redoubled its support for the genocidal terrorist uh, regime Hamas. It has uh, levelled in this application unfounded and outlandish allegations of genocide against Israel a mere few months after real acts of genocide were perpetrated by Palestinian terrorists in uh, what we know to be the bloodiest attack uh, against Jews since the Holocaust. Now, the definition of genocide is not at issue here. It is uh, well settled and commonly agreed. It is different from other crimes, 
um, for example, murder or, or theft, where you have a, an act which becomes a crime if it is committed with a particular state of mind, intention. Um, many members of our audience may be familiar with the terms actus reus and mens rea. Genocide, uh, however, is uh, different. It is a term crafted after the Holocaust. It was, of course, famously coined by Raphael Lemkin to describe the systematic extermination of Jews by the Nazis. And with genocide, one starts with the state of mind. Uh, the state of mind is critical. It is uh, the defining element of the crime. Um, it is defined as intention to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. So if an entity has that intention, and only if that intention can be proved, you then go on to see when, whether any of the acts which are specified um, have in fact been committed. And those acts include killing members of a national or ethnic group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, and inflicting conditions of life which are calculated to bring about the group's physical destruction. Now, it's interesting to note that what connects these acts is that they can be used in order to serve the intention or the purpose uh, of destroying a group simply because it is a group. And of course, the term um, genocide recognised the targeting uh, specifically of Jews uh, simply by virtue of the fact that they were Jews. The internationally agreed definition appears at Article 2 of the Genocide Convention of 1948. Against this context, I am reminded um, of an interview in October in which senior Hamas official uh, Ghazi Hamed stated that the terror group would uh, repeat the 7th of October massacre again and again until Israel was annihilated. Uh, openly admitting that group's genocidal intentions, uh, one may think. But how does the court determine whether the requisite intention exists? Well, at an initial stage, an inference might be possible. Uh, in its judgment in Bosnia and Serbia um, in 2007, the International Court of Justice accepted the possibility of inferring special genocidal intent from a pattern of conduct uh, but it insisted at paragraph 373 that for a pattern of conduct to be accepted as evidence of its existence, it would have to be such that it could only point to the existence of such intent. Uh, this was also addressed later in the uh, Croatia and Serbia case um, at paragraph 148, where uh, the court was clear that in order for the court to infer the existence of genocidal intent from a pattern of conduct, it must be the only inference that could reasonably be drawn from the acts in question. Um, now, that is at the preliminary stage. Uh, at the merit stage, there is a higher test. Um, for example, in the case, uh, in the 2007 case of Bosnia, Herzegovina and Serbia, Montenegro, um, the case concerning the application of the Convention on the Prevention uh, and Punishment of the crime of genocide. The ICJ required uh, persuasive and consistent evidence for such a pattern to emerge uh, at paragraph 242 and, and with an addition, an additional requirement that there are no other reasons for engaging in that pattern, so no alternative explanation. Uh, and in uh, Serbia, uh, in the Croatia Serbia case, the court also referred to a fully conclusive standard of proof. Now, one may think that in light of this and, and the other evidence uh, from the Hamas leadership, uh, from the interrogation of terrorists that were captured after the 7th of October, uh, and even from the Hamas charter, that there is uh, perhaps ample evidence uh, of genocide perpetrated by Palestinian terrorists on the 7th of October, but that does not seem to have piqued the interest of the relevant international legal institutions, uh, or indeed, uh, the state's party to the genocide convention uh, who have an obligation to prevent and punish uh, genocide uh, under that convention. But what we have instead is this 84 page application by South Africa. And there are two major areas of misrepresentation um, that I would propose to address. 
Um, one is on the question of intention. And in this respect, um, the uh, document cites Israeli leaders, including Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, the Chief of Staff, uh, Khatsi Khalevi. Um, and these are, I, I should stress, individuals who have been unequivocal um, and have repeatedly stated that the goal of Israel's operation in Gaza is to eliminate Hamas by destroying its military and uh, its governing capabilities. And despite that, we have a series of quotations uh, provided by uh, the lawyers drafting the submission for South Africa, which are uh, misrepresented. Uh, they are provided without proper context, um, or they are even fabricated. And uh, an example of, of uh, such a fabrication exists. Uh, I, anyone who has the application to hand, I refer you to footnote 506, uh, which relies on a Middle East Eye report that purports to quote a former Israeli Knesset member uh, and uh, quotes him as calling for the complete destruction of Gaza. It names this former Knesset member as Danny Neumann. Um, this is uh, an individual of, 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 who simply doesn't exist as a former Knesset member. Um, and uh, it is perhaps indicative of the, the dangers of many of the sources that uh, this application has relied on uh, in the footnotes, uh, the news reports, uh, many also from Arab media, uh, that uh, so much of the information that has been provided to the court is, is so desperately unreliable. Um, UKLFI has in fact addressed the proper context of a number of the quotations that have been used to ground these allegations of genocide, and it has done so before uh, this application was made. Uh, that is available again in a note on the UKLFI website, uh, which we can also link to in, in the chat function on this webinar. This was, as I say, prepared before the South Africa application um, uh, that has uh, listed many more quotations um, and deployed uh, those, uh, but but it is indicative, I think, of of uh, providing some of the additional context uh, which we do in that note. Um, it's very easy. It, it's it's easy, I think, to distinguish what we see in the South African application, um, which is devoid of that context. But it also strikes me as being deployed based on an attribution of evil intent to Israel which is simply not borne out by a, an honest interrogation of the quotations. So that, that is the first element where this application fails is, is on the critical in, intention point. But um, the supposed evidence that is put forward uh, of Israel's actions in the brief ranges from uh, the incredulous to the preposterous. Allegations of uh, summary execution of prisoners, of the targeting of civilians, um, which really are properly called out as, as blood libels. And there are glaring omissions also. Um, the uh, host of measures taken by Israel to minimize civilian casualties, um, how uh, that can be consistent with the existence of genocidal intent is simply not addressed. Um, and in this, I include, for example, the extensive use of early warnings uh, and measures to facilitate greater access to humanitarian provisions, including through the, the Kerem Shalom crossing, which Israel has opened. Um, whether there are any alternative explanations for civilians being killed in Gaza is, is also missing. Uh, for example, Hamas's use of uh, civilians as human shields or Hamas's targeting of its own civilians or Palestinian missiles falling short in Gaza or uh, where there may be tactical or strategic reasons other than an intent to destroy the Palestinian people for the Israeli military action. Uh, for example, in the context of military necessity uh, or self-defense or deterrence, nowhere in uh, the South African uh, application is it mentioned, uh, in fact, that Hamas embeds itself within the civilian population in the Gaza Strip and systematically uses civilians and civilian infrastructure as human shields, effectively uh, rendering it impossible for, for any attack um, directed by Israel not to cause uh, some collateral damage. And there is a glaring omission when it comes to applying common sense. I mean, given Israel's accepted military cap capacity and capabilities, uh, plainly to inflict far more harm to civilians in Gaza than it has done, whether it is in fact more likely that Israel's military campaign is directed against Hamas, uh, as 
has been repeatedly articulated uh, by Israel's leaders, uh, rather than directed against the Palestinian people uh, of Gaza. It feels almost uncomfortable to state the obvious like this, but uh, South Africa and numerous UN bodies that it quotes in its application have unfortunately made it necessary to do exactly that. The civilian to combatant ratio uh, that Israel has um, indicated uh, provisionally in the context of its campaign over the last uh, two months is two to one, two uh, civilians for every one combatant. Um, and this is uh, even on, on the Hamas figures, those put out by the Hamas-controlled Palestinian uh, Ministry of Health, um, which we uh, have previously addressed um, the difficulties with reliance uh, on those and the absence of any uh, means of verifying those figures. But even if we compare, uh, based on those figures and Israel's assessment of a um, civilian to combatant ratio of two to one, and we compare that to UN statistics uh, of a global nine to one, nine civilians killed for every one combatant uh, in the context of urban warfare globally, uh, or the figures that have been put forward for with respect to allied uh, forces or American uh, forces in Afghanistan and Iraq between three, uh, three to one and five to one, then in all of those instances, the statistics speak extremely loudly uh, as to the preventative measures that Israel has taken and Israel's uh, exercise of precaution, compliance with the principle of precaution uh, in the context of its campaign in Gaza. And that is also borne out uh, by some of the reaction, perhaps, to uh, South Africa's application during, um, but also more broadly to, to the allegations of genocide, which of course uh, have preceded uh, this recent application. Uh, during a briefing on the 20th of November, US uh, National Security Council spokesperson uh, John Kirby uh, addressed the inappropriateness of the term genocide to describe Israel's actions in Gaza. Uh, he said Israel isn't trying to wipe the Palestinian people off of the map. Israel isn't trying to wipe Gaza off of the map. Israel is trying to defend itself against a genocidal threat. So if we are going to start using that word, let's use it appropriately. That was, of course, in advance of this application this week. When asked about South Africa's claim against Israel, uh, John Kirby uh, was uh, unequivocal, saying that the US finds this submission meritless, counterproductive, and completely without any basis in fact whatsoever. Next week, the International Court of Justice is set to hold its first hearing in the case. Um, this is with regard to provisional measures under Article 41.1, of the uh, ICJ statute, uh, which provides that the court shall have power to indicate if it considers that circumstances uh, so require any provisional measures which ought to be taken to preserve the respective rights of either party. Now, it seems um, pretty plausible that South Africa's reference to the ICJ was tailored to focus on the Genocide Convention because uh, Israel uh, as a party to that treaty is subject to the court's jurisdiction in relation to this specific international treaty. And that is um, plainly the context um, of the application that has been brought. But there are um, some arguments I think that uh, are relevant to South Africa's application, which is essentially in support of, of the genocidal campaign, which is currently being carried out by Hamas. Um, one is that it may constitute a conspiracy to commit genocide in violation of the very same genocide convention. Uh, also that it provides material support for terrorism in violation of South Africa's duties under Security Council Resolution 1373, uh, which includes the obligation not to support terror and to take necessary steps to prevent the commission of terrorist acts. The application may also contribute to the commission of terrorist crimes under relevant international conventions, uh, to which South Africa is a party, which include uh, international conventions for the suppression of the financing of terrorism and the suppression uh, of terrorist bombings. All of these arguments could certainly be made and would have far more weight than the position which South Africa has advanced to victim blame, uh, defame Israel and stoke anti-Semitism with blood libels against Jews. South Africa's application uh, to the ICJ is part of 
a broader and even more troubling course of action uh, in that this application seeks, it seems, to hijack the International Court of Justice uh, for uh, an agenda to create uh, essentially an international apartheid system in which the Jewish state is isolated and in which Israel is stripped of its legal rights. And if the UK, uh, the ICJ um, submits to this campaign, it really does risk becoming an instrument of that in apartheid, that anti-Semitic apartheid, uh, and it risks losing its credibility as a court of law. And as I indicated at the outset, this has serious implications for international legal order, especially at a time of decreasing compliance with uh, the ICJ's uh, provisional measures, as we have seen in many recent cases. Um, in so many respects, South Africa's uh, actions constitute uh, an, an outrage that I would say is, is worse than crying wolf and it's worse than victim blaming. Um, because this application falsely blames the real victims of a genocide for perpetrating a genocide, where their precaution and restraint in self-defense has been unparalleled, this abuse of international legal institutions should really worry every single uh, one of us that cares about the rule of law. Uh, and in particular, uh, that is because of its damaging effect on legal order and on the credibility of international law, and that is palpable. It sends a message also to Hamas and to uh, fellow genocidal Islamic fundamentalists that they may commit real war crimes and real crimes against humanity and real genocide with impunity while their victims are put on trial. And on that note, Daniel, I'd be very happy to take uh, some of the questions that have been put. Well, we, we've had a lot and uh, some were emailed earlier as well. But let, let me start with this. A couple of people have asked about, is this going to be a show trial? Or let's look at potential bias of judges. Some judges uh, may be inclined to follow their own nation's foreign policies, China, Russia, etc. How political is the ICJ and, and is there a risk of this being a show trial? How real is that? Uh, I, I think there's also perhaps no coincidence uh, that the case uh, that South Africa has brought um, is one that it's brought now as opposed to previously. Uh, the allegations that South Africa has made against Israel um, have certainly come to a head now in the context of, of the recent campaign, but it has consistently made allegations that Israel breaches uh, international law, unfounded allegations, uh, I would say. Um, but there have been some recent changes uh, and appointments to the court, and those are looked at very closely by international lawyers um, as and when uh, new judges are, are proposed uh, and presented. Uh, and inevitably, in any international uh, legal institution uh, where, country, where, where, where judges essentially represent countries, um, there are always going to be discussions about their proclivities and uh, their potential leanings or biases. Um, but in the context of the remarks I was making earlier um, about the history of the International Court of Justice, I am bound to say that it has uh, for a long time benefited from um, a, a relatively positive reputation, uh, far more so uh, than perhaps the International Criminal Court, uh, which has a, an abysmal track record uh, and has come under substantial criticism and in fact has been the subject to a, a, a full-blown investigation um, because of, uh, of, of the difficulties associated and the, the politicization of that court. Um, so that has been less of an issue with the International Court of Justice uh, albeit some of the issues that I raised with respect to the 2004 uh, wall advisory opinion. But I think there's real concern uh, that uh, this court now, in this particular context, uh, if it does entertain these uh, two uh, attempted lawfare initiatives, uh, may very well uh, fall into uh, dangerous waters, uh, and that its reputation will suffer significantly from that. And I think the judges are um, appointed for, uh, is it seven years? Uh, sorry, three-year terms. And I think the terms are a little bit longer than that, but I would have to... Uh, I would well, have yeah, to I'll, I'll double-check that and I'll put that in the, in the chat. Um, 
hopefully it will be a fair hearing. And on that basis, there's a, a question here. Can the ICJ reject an application as inadmissible or stay it if it's clearly based on a political rather than on political rather than legal arguments? So maybe focus on the UN General Assembly uh, one, which is, is plainly um, politically motivated and make uh, add some very, very loaded questions. Um, can it be rejected at the outset? Um, it would, I think, be open to the International Court of Justice to decline to offer uh, an opinion um, in the context in which the uh, General Assembly has has asked for one. And in fact, the submission that UKLFI has made uh, recommends that course of action on the basis that it simply does not have the material before it uh, to properly make the assessment that it's being asked to make. Um, likewise, of course, uh, with respect to the contentious case that has been brought, uh, it would be open to the court certainly to dismiss the application for provisional measures uh, and ultimately dismiss South Africa's application uh, against Israel as being uh, without merit. Um, the difficulty is that the weight of material that has been, I, I mentioned some of the fallacious footnotes uh, in the application that South Africa has brought. Uh, but the bulk of the material that is relied upon uh, are reports of UN bodies, um, and they go back some substantial distance. Uh, so the manufacturing of many of these reports against Israel, uh, promoting false claims and false allegations uh, against Israel and putting forward... Um, uh, supposed evidence in relation to them uh, has been of some long standing. And so this isn't, a, I, I have to stress, this isn't a situation that has arisen overnight. Uh, and it is one that has an awful lot of um, UN documentation behind it. Um, similar, perhaps, to the 2004 advisory opinion, but in the intervening period, the volume of material, uh, as well as the, um, the the extreme nature of the material, uh, has become far more significant. Uh, questions have popped up which I quite like, because uh, apart from you being one of the advocacy heroes of this conflict, another one is Douglas Murray, and one of the... Um, uh, get, uh, one of our audience has observed a copy of his book War on the West on your bookshelf and asks to what extent um, do these uh, resolutions, well not resolutions, the, these uh, cases serve an example of legal warfare not just against Israel but against uh, Western institutions uh, including the legal process of international law? I, I think it's a, a really serious issue and it's in fact one that I wrote about several years ago with respect to the International Criminal Court um, suggesting that it had jurisdiction over a non-state party uh, to the Rome Statute, uh, Israel, uh, even though uh, at the time um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson was crystal clear that um, the UK did not consider that the International Criminal Court had jurisdiction uh, in that case, in that investigation that I mentioned right at the outset of, of these remarks, um, the uh, suggestion by the court and, and in fact the determination by the majority in pre-trial chamber one of the question of jurisdiction in that case uh, did spell uh, serious problems, I thought, and I argued in, in that paper, uh, also for the interests of law-abiding uh, states such as the UK uh, and the potential for politicised claims to be brought uh, with respect to, to UK nationals, especially those who'd been serving in the, in the British Armed Forces. Um, so, as I've indicated uh, on a couple of occasions, this is this is not just about Israel. Uh, unfortunately, abuses of international law and the eroding of the legitimacy and and of the of the rule of law in this context uh, can be, and I'm afraid will be, uh, deployed by the enemies of uh, freedom uh, and liberal democracy uh, and those values. Um, and uh, what starts with Israel, as, as we uh, are frequently reminded, is unlikely to end with Israel. No, we're, we're the canary down the mine, it's often said. Um, Let's jump back to your comments on intent, because they're interesting. Um, you discussed uh, that an inference can be drawn if the pattern 
is such that it can only point to intent. And there may perhaps be examples of this going on in other places in the world, um, for example, the Janjaweed. What about recklessness? In criminal law, intent can be formed by recklessness. And there's a number of questions in the chat where, and I know your comments before about two civilians to one combatant, or terrorist in this case, but that can still be a lot. And uh, somebody has asked, um, how many Palestinian civilians is it worth sacrificing in order to fight the war against Hamas? Of course, Israel can protect itself by tightening security and military, some military action, but is uh, doing so at the cost of 10,000 Palestinian civilians ethnically justified? And we've had a couple of other similar um, questions. Um, it leads to whether or not if Israel is found to have acted recklessly by the way in which it's waged its war, and I'm sure you'll comment on the uh, efforts Israel has made to protect uh, civilians, um, could recklessness form intent? So there are a couple of points to pick up here. Um, uh, recklessness with respect to genocide couldn't uh, because the intention to um, uh, commit uh, the specified acts in order to destroy a, a group is is integral uh, to the crime of, of genocide. Um, and I explained its origins coming out of uh, the Holocaust um, and uh, the Second World War. Um, but uh, there are, of course, other crimes that could be committed, uh, not just genocide. And many of the allegations against Israel are for crimes against humanity or war crimes uh, and breaches of international humanitarian law. And this is where um, I have to uh, address the uh, approach that the questioner or one of the questioners has taken um, because it, it is not a numbers game. It, it is not appropriate to say how many uh, civilian casualties uh, can be justified uh, in the context of Israel's operation uh, in Gaza. That unfortunately is a, a backward approach to how international law uh, deals with these situations and these matters. Um, I've previously addressed the principle of proportionality and been mm -hmm. clear that it is not a numbers game. It is not about weighing up uh, civilian casualties on both sides. And it's equally not about um, looking at purported casualty figures in the abstract. Uh, proportionality. And in fact, it's important to stress that one of the reasons uh, that it's not appropriate to do so is that the um, conclusion of the logic that that questioner has posed uh, is that uh, Hamas must therefore be immune if it puts civilians on top of its rocket launch sites uh, and buries its command centers in hospitals. Uh, that would that would render terrorist infrastructure immune from attack, and that simply cannot be the case. And if we want to talk about implications for other law-abiding armies, um, the promotion of that logic or, or that reasoning would have serious impacts for the ability of the United States and the UK <clears throat> to conduct um, lawful, uh, uh, proper um, military operations in the future, it's very important that uh, the discussion about international law doesn't get uh, infected by that sort of warped analysis and warped logic. Uh, the law of armed conflict is very clear, uh, and it is also intention based. It is not an effects analysis, uh, and it requires, in terms of proportionality, strikes that are conducted to be proportionate uh, so that the military advantage of each strike is weighed up against the anticipated civilian collateral damage. Uh, and that is a balancing exercise and one that is taken extremely seriously by the Israeli Defense Forces. Uh, there is a, a whole department of the Military Advocate General Corps that is intimately involved in target selection and the approval of strikes to an extent that is unprecedented in any um, Western modern law abiding army. Um, and, and that is, in fact, what is, uh, I think, prompted the United States in the quotations that I referenced to be so uh, unequivocal uh, in um, recognizing those measures, those unprecedented measures. And in fact, uh, it has also been acknowledged by US officials that the United States would struggle 
to take the sorts of measures and takes the sorts of, of precautions that Israel is adopting. So I, I appreciate it is out of sync with the received wisdom and certainly with the reporting that we have been seeing uh, on the devastating situation uh, in Gaza. Uh, but that is the law, and that is also the correct factual analysis of Israel's approach in this case. Now, before I move on to, I want to look at possible sanctions, etc., in a moment against Israel in the event that Israel isn't successful in defending these cases. Um, but before that, I think it might help. There's been some... Uh, and again, a couple of people have raised this in the uh, Q&A. There have been some um, perhaps unfa unhelpful comments by certain Israeli ministers. Um, I, there, there may be some misunderstanding amongst commentators in the West, particularly in the media, as to who they're speaking on behalf of, and perhaps not understanding there's a, a war cabinet at the moment. Can you expand on that? Well, you're absolutely right that there is a, a war cabinet, and I I would suggest that it's the um, the public statements of those members of the war cabinet and also of of military officials uh, that are most pertinent um, for analysis in this particular context. Um, I mentioned analysis of some of the uh, comments that have been highlighted uh, and deployed by those critical of, of Israel that UK LFI has conducted and provided the proper context. Uh, for example, many of them where it suggested that uh, comments have been made about Palestinians in general have plainly been with respect to Hamas and Israel's aim of um, eradicating Hamas, not the Palestinian people. Um, but plainly, uh, more recent comments, especially from uh, so-called backbenchers or ministers that are not involved in the government uh, that have suggested uh, the transfer of populations. Um, although, I mean, in many of those contexts, of course, uh, it, it is difficult to um, it, it is difficult to properly understand when 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 there are efforts being made, not just by Israel but also by international uh, other international actors to evacuate civilian populations from terrorist um, hotspots within the Gaza Strip. Uh, th that is something that uh, I believe most reasonable people should see as, as a positive. It is intended to save the lives of civilians uh, and to provide those civilians with um, access to uh, humanitarian corridors and, and, and safe passages. Um, to areas where they can be provided with humanitarian assistance. I mean, the fact that that has been misrepresented uh, as uh, supposedly ethnic cleansing uh, or the transfer of populations or a war crime is is pretty extraordinary. Um, but one sees these, unfortunately, one sees these misrepresentations in a in a in a widespread fashion. Um, the comments, as I mentioned, uh, many of them we provided additional context in the con in in the note, uh, which I've referenced, which appears on the UKLFI website. Um, but all of that, where it has been deployed to evidence an intention, uh, unfortunately, I think ev even if we were to take it in the misrepresented fashion, fails to come up to proof, uh, because uh, those comments, that rhetoric. Uh, and we can compare perhaps with um, Churchill's statements in World War II uh, or the uh, Allied statements in the context of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, that rhetoric is separate from the actions that have been carried out uh, and the intention that is clear uh, from those actions. And that is properly informed by uh, the, the statements that we've had from the IDF uh, seeking to evacuate Palestinian civilians from areas uh, of uh, intense conflict and seeking to target Hamas uh, precisely with precision strikes um, and, uh, and, and also with warnings. So it's not enough just to look at uh, statements that politicians have made, uh, although it's important to look at those, as I say, in the proper context and not to misrepresent them. We've not gone long left. There are a couple of other subjects I'd like to cover, though, so I hope you don't mind if we run over a little. But um, in the event that there are findings against Israel, um, 
we're being asked what are the possible sanctions i might group a couple of questions here together what are the possible sanctions that could be taken against israel um and uh is the um uh, is there a veto in the security council and an interesting question which is what if israel as nuclear power um refuses um to abide by uh, any um uh, uh, judgment requesting a ceasefire, who could force them to do it? Uh, which is, I think, quite a, an interesting question. Uh, but really, what are the sanctions that are available? Let's start with that. So that depends on which of the cases we're we're considering. Um, if we start with the contentious case and the application for, for provisional measures, which does include um, this uh, this request that South Africa has made that Israel uh, stop its operation in Gaza. I mean, I think the first thing to say about that is that would be extraordinary uh, because it would, I think, be the first time that the court uh, would essentially be uh, suggesting that a state was um, not permitted to defend itself. Um, and that would be unprecedented. Uh, in such a context, I, I cannot see Israel complying. Uh, I cannot see uh, that it would be permitted. Uh, this is the state of Israel. It has its own obligations, its primary obligation to keep the citizens of Israel safe. Uh, and it cannot be required by any... Um, sensible, reasonable international legal order to sit on its hands while it is being attacked. And let us not forget that the rockets um, uh, sirens have continued in the course of today. So Israeli civilian communities uh, remain under attack. Uh, the idea that any court could order it to sit on its hands uh, in a legitimate uh, and, and have legitimacy in doing so is, is mind boggling. Um, so that would be, I think, uncharted waters. Uh, and I mentioned that the compliance with provisional measures has been uh, rapidly decreasing, especially in recent years. Uh, so there are no uh, means or mechanisms necessarily uh, to enforce those provisions. Um, but it is something that uh, states, if they are law abiding and they care about international law, would often uh, wish to bring themselves into conformity with. Uh, and uh, up until at this point, Israel has always uh, been at great pains to ensure that it does comply with international law. Um, you made reference to a UN Security Council veto, and I recall seeing that, that question briefly. And I think it's important just to highlight uh, that the only uh, binding uh, legal determinations uh, which are perhaps relevant to mention here. One would be a determination of the International Court of Justice in a contentious case, so not in a in, a, in an advisory opinion, but in, in a dispute between two parties. Another is a UN Security Council resolution, which is made under Chapter 7. No other resolution passed by the United Nations is in fact legally binding. General Assembly resolutions are not, and the vast majority of UN Security Council resolutions which are made under Chapter 6 are equally not legally binding. Um, there are big misnomers uh, about that. And I think that's, yeah, we resolve. That, that's it. And, and I think that's important to, uh, to, to, to clarify that these are political uh, as opposed to legal uh, matters. Um, and finally, with respect to the advisory opinion, I mean, what is being requested by the General Assembly, um, in which, of course, there is always an automatic majority against Israel, it's important to qualify uh, the resolution that has requested the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice with, with that. Um, what is being requested is an indication of what measures should be taken. Uh, and the, the clear inference there is sanctions. Um, the idea that uh, South Africa was uh, isolated by the international community during the time of apartheid is one is 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 a frequently heard refrain with respect to um, those that are uh, challenging uh, Israel and and seeking to delegitimize Israel on the international stage. Uh, it is a cornerstone, of course, of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. And what we are now seeing is these lawfare initiatives to seek to uh, up the ante uh, on uh, that mission uh, to seek to place sanctions uh, on Israel. And of course, in terms of the uh, importance of the veto, we have seen the United States deploying it um, in the context of UN Security Council resolutions, uh, which uh, were 
likewise seeking to prevent Israel from uh, defending itself uh, and made no reference, unfortunately, uh, to the horrific attacks um, perpetrated by Hamas and other Palestinian terrorist organizations, uh, which unfortunately began this very uh, tragic series of events. Well, that... I think leads me on to my final um, block of questions. We've been asked by a number of people, and um, it may well be perhaps some of this is material for a future webinar. Legal actions that are available to Israel. Um, uh, we've had a number of questions as to whether any action can be taken against Hamas. I think Israel's actually taking fairly effective action against Hamas at the moment. And, and, um, but against uh, other organizations, perhaps those that have been backing Hamas, such as Iran, um, is there a basis for a case at the ICJ uh, against Iran? Um, and is there a basis for action against UN uh, bodies such as UNRWA, uh, who have been brainwashing children with hatred, which led to the actions of October the 7th? Well, there are certainly political initiatives, uh, which I think should absolutely be uh, be given uh, full force with respect to um, the complicity of, of many uh, UN bodies, including UNRWA, uh, unfortunately, um, and the evidence of this is, is mounting um, in terms of uh, their support for Hamas and, and their complicity even in, in some of the crimes that have been committed uh, by Hamas. Um, in terms of the, um, I forgot, I'm so sorry, Dan, I've forgotten the first part of your... Uh, well, your... is there a basis for a case against um, national sponsors of Hamas? Well, that's, yes. And, and you mentioned Iran specifically. So I think, you know, a, a, realistically, you know, a, a case at bringing cases at the International Court of Justice works where you are talking about law abiding states. Um, who are going to be inclined to comply with uh, the ruling of the International Court of Justice in a contentious case. Um, and so where you are dealing with rogue states and those that flout international law, uh, such as Iran, um, the legal mechanisms and levers that can be deployed uh, are unfortunately uh, far more limited. Um, but so far as the you know, provisions of international law, uh, I mentioned UN Security Council resolutions made under Chapter 7, that they are the only uh, legally binding resolutions that can be passed at the United Nations. One such resolution um, that I mentioned in, in my remarks earlier is 1373, uh, which uh, was passed soon after the 7th um, forgive me, this, the 11th of September attacks, um, and uh, requires, amongst other things, states uh, to... Uh, combat terrorism uh, and and prevent the uh, funding, the direct and in, uh, indirect support for terrorism. Uh, I, as I indicated, I think there is a case to be made uh, that even South Africa's application here, quite apart from the fact that it has hosted Hamas delegations after the 7th of October, that it has voiced support for uh, the organization, this, this prescribed terrorist organization, um, there are certainly... Um, uh, there is a case to be made that uh, South Africa is is uh, uh, has failed or has breached its legal obligations uh, under, uh, amongst it, other things, UN Security Council Resolution uh, 1373. Um, but if it was left up to Israel to bring such a case, uh, I think that uh, un unfortunately that state has a great deal more to deal with at the moment. Um, and one thing that uh, we haven't seen uh, is Israel seeking to deploy lawfare initiatives, uh, even um, uh, even legitimate cases. Uh, it, it is uh, plainly more interested uh, in seeking to, to do right uh, by its own citizens and critically also uh, the Palestinian uh, civilians uh, that are subject to the atrocities uh, also that are committed against them by Hamas. I mean, it's, it's interesting, that final point, that any government, its first duty is to its citizens. And yet, if we look at either of the Hamas charters, they only mention their own population in the context of jihad. And, and um, yeah, it's uh, sad. But I think on that note, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a follow up webinar on this as the, the in particular the South Africa case progresses. Uh, we've been literally inundated with questions. Uh, again, 
um, the um, submissions that UKLFI have done are on our website. Somebody asked about the UN statistics that you cited earlier. They're in there. Um, uh, and I'm sorry I didn't have time for everybody's questions. Somebody did mention a comment about the bottle of whiskey behind me, and I think the most sensible thing all of us can do is go and have one. But um, again, Natasha, you've been absolutely fantastic, and uh, we, we really are very fortunate to have you um, on side and as part of UKNFI. So thank you, everybody. Until next time. Thank you so much, Daniel, for everything that you're doing for UK Lawyers for Israel. Uh, you've been an, an absolute asset, and I'm tremendously grateful also to our audience uh, for, for bearing with us in, in such volume. Yeah, we will keep going. So thank you, everybody. Take care.